Hi everyone. Today I want to try to convince you that you can do it in SQL. My name is Drew Bannon and I'm the Chief Product Officer and one of the co-founders at a company called Fishtown Analytics. I've had the tagline Mo Data Mo Problems on my LinkedIn profile for seven or eight years now uh, and every year that goes by I think it's more and more true. Uh, if you want to talk to me about SQL or anything else you can find me on Twitter at Drew Bannon. So really quick on Fishtown Analytics. Uh, we're the company that maintains DBT, which is open core data modeling software that provides a SQL, for, a SQL first workflow for data modeling, data testing, data documentation, and, and more. Uh, you can see the screenshot here is of the sort of data documentation uh, that's built into DBT. Uh, and so if you uh, like this talk and you're into the idea of SQL, you should definitely check us out at getdbt.com. Just a couple of confessions and disclaimers before we get started. Um, I have never written a line of production Scala code in my life, but I have written a whole lot of SQL over the past few years. Um, so there's not going to be any sort of like side by side uh, Scala data frame versus SQL comparisons here. In general, I think the people who tolerate Python packaging don't get to complain about the JVM, so to each their own. I just love SQL. Um, I fell in love with SQL back in 2014, and up until that point, my experiences with SQL were pretty limited to application development with uh, MySQL as a backing database. Um, I didn't really understand SQL and I was a little bit afraid of it and it felt like there was a lot that I didn't know and um, I couldn't understand why some of the queries that I ran were pretty fast and others uh, never, never actually returned. Um, so that all changed back in 2014 when I started doing uh, more analytics. I had been building an event tracking pipeline and got into sort of A-B testing and did a lot of SQL-based analytics using Amazon Redshift back then. Um, so that kind of changed everything for me and it's opened up the world of SQL to me. Um, since then, it's been a powerful tool in my tool belt and I've seen a lot of other folks uh, sort of grow and do really impactful work uh, via the entry point of, of SQL. Um, so here are some of the things that I love most about SQL. For one, it's expressive. Uh, SQL reads more or less like you know a real sentence, and so it makes it really easy to get started with a select statement. Um, it's a very deep well that you can go down in SQL, and there's a lot to master. We'll talk about some of those things later today, but at the highest level, uh, if you can read one SQL query, you can read most SQL queries, and I think that's a beautiful thing. SQL is just so accessible. Um, lots of people can learn it pretty quickly, and I think that's part of why it's had this multi-decade long staying power in the sort of data and analytics space. Um, the barrier to entry is, is fairly low for SQL. And um, because lots of people can, can write SQL and read SQL, it creates these integration points where people can collaborate around SQL for sort of data use cases. SQL is universal. Um, most databases speak SQL with pretty consistent support across them. Um, I think that you know, if you've, if you've kind of got a handle on the SQL 99 spec, it's going to cover 90-ish percent of what you'd see in most uh, databases that speak SQL. Um, and what that means is that whether you're working with um, like a newer data warehouse or uh, some other tools, you're going to be able to transfer that knowledge that you have about SQL into whatever database that you're using. And I think that a lot of this like expressiveness and accessibility and uh, universality of, of SQL really comes from the fact that it's declarative. So there's no moving parts. There are kind of limited opportunities for the bad kind of magic that you sometimes see in programming languages. And recall, you know, I, I've written a lot of Python in my day, so I know magic when I see it. Um, because it's declarative, you get to just express the data set that you want to see, and you leave the heavy lifting and sort of the data access patterns to the database which in most cases, these databases can really optimize your queries to get the, um, get the data back to you faster for whatever you want to use the data for. Finally, SQL is thought provoking. Um, a lot of people have opinions on, on where the commas go or indentation or capitalization, uh, uh, common table expressions versus subqueries. Um, I like that there's this sort of vigorous debate around SQL. Uh, I think it makes for a fun environment in which to work and collaborate. So I just want to take a little bit of time and talk about some of the things that you could do in SQL that you might not be familiar with if you haven't spent a lot of time there or if you've only scratched the surface with SQL. Um, I can tell you that while SQL is a declarative and, and sort of straightforward language, 
Uh, it is very, very powerful. And it's pretty rare that I encounter a problem I can't solve in SQL, um, at least in the analytics and BI space. Um, so if you've written off SQL already, or if you haven't dug in uh, super deep yet, hopefully you can take some things away from this, uh, this next section and you'll give it another chance. So the first technique we're gonna talk about is uh, pivoting columns. So when we talk about pivoting columns, the big idea is that we wanna take rows of data and translate them into columns of data. We would do that to derive new metrics from the existing rows in a table. So we can look at an example. This is an events table. And so there's a user who did an event at a certain time. That's an events table. And if we look at it, uh, you know, there's sign up events and purchase events for a couple or really a few different users. Uh, so we have users one, two, and three. And depending on the user, they've either signed up and purchased or only signed up. The big idea is we want to translate this table into a different table that has one record per user and the date that that user signed up and their number of purchases. So we can do that in SQL using this sort of pivot uh, uh, design pattern. So here's the code that would do that for you in SQL. It's a really great design pattern. I employ it all the time. And the big idea is that you want to couple together an aggregate function with an expression. So in this case, the expression is a case when statement and the aggregate function is the, the minimum or min function. So what we're doing here is we're saying if the event is a signup event, then we want to take the happened at timestamp, otherwise give us a null value. And so what this effectively means is if there are no events uh, named sign up, uh, then you're going to get a null value and the minimum of a bunch of null values is going to be a null. So if you've never had a sign up event, you will have a null sign up date uh, versus if you have had a sign up event, then we'll take the minimum uh, happened at timestamp for, for those events. Um, we can see a similar example below for purchases. Here, we're doing kind of the same thing, but instead of a minimum, uh, we're going to do a sum. And so basically, this is counting the number of events that are purchase events. Um, so this is one of those examples of SQL being really composable. Like maybe you've seen uh, min or sum functions before. Maybe you've seen you know case when expressions. But by combining them together, we can kind of implement this new pattern and do some pretty cool things with SQL. So the second technique we're going to talk about is appending data sets. Um, so in this example, we're uh, going to think about unioning a couple of tables together. And so the reason you want to do this is to combine different tables with similar schemas into a single table that's sort of taller. Uh, it has more rows in it. So it's a bit of a concatenation that we want to do. So here's an example in which you have uh, two tables, one for web events and one for mobile events. And maybe if the person uh, tracking these events had asked you, they would have been a single table, but maybe they didn't ask you. And so you have two different tables that you want to concatenate together that would look like all events. So for the web events, we see you know, sign up and purchase. For the mobile events, we see app install and screen view, just as an example. So if you want to concatenate these two different tables into a single table that looks kind of more like this, one of the things that would be really helpful is if we can add another column called source that kind of indicates the provenance of these events. So in this case, the, the yellow rows are the sort of mobile events that came from the mobile events table. The blue uh, records are the web events that came from the, the web events table. So here's how you do that in SQL. Uh, there's a really simple operator, it's called union all, and you can use it to concatenate two different uh, queries together that share a schema. And so the thing that kind of makes this feel like a design pattern is this idea of adding new columns to the expression to uh, indicate the provenance for you know, each part of the union. And so you don't have to scratch your head and think about, was this a mobile event or was it a web event? You can just if it was from the web or from the mobile app. Um, this is also a really powerful way if you have two uh, tables with similar but not congruent schemas to sort of create new columns or omit columns to make sure that the table schemas are, are congruent and that they can be union together. Um, in practice, SQL has a couple other set operators for uh, set differences or set intersections that can be really useful uh, for different kinds of use cases. So the last technique that we're going to talk about is window functions. Um, if you haven't seen window functions before, the big idea is that they apply transformations over just kind of a part of a table. Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, there's a million reasons why window functions are uh, very helpful. They're kind of like aggregates, but you get to kind of group by uh, different slices of the table or what we'll call partitions. Um, and it turns out there's, there's a lot of reasons why that can be really helpful. So we'll take an example. 
In this case, we've got two different users with kind of two different uh, sets of page views. One looked at the product page and sign up page. One only looked at, uh, we say the app page. And there's also a user touches table that we want to kind of create. So in this user touches table, we want to show the first page path that the user visited. And this is going to be sort of where the user landed in your app. And so this could be helpful if you're doing uh, like marketing attribution or sort of a landing page analysis. You want to understand where did the user come from on their first visit to the site, like first touch analytics, for instance. Um, so we can do this very, very easily with SQL. Uh, and if you don't have window functions uh, at your disposal, it could actually be pretty hard to do in SQL. So here's what this looks like. Uh, there's a special window function called first value. And anytime you use a window function, you have, you have the option to specify a partition clause and an order by clause. So our partition clause is gonna say, uh, give me the first value for each page path, but only within each group of users. So you don't want the first page path ever viewed by any user. You just want the first uh, page path viewed for each individual user. And then how do we know what the first value is? Uh, we have to tell SQL how to order the events. And so we do that with this order by clause. Um, so this query, if you run it, will give you this table on the right hand side. It's a very, very quick way to uh, get like the first value out of an event stream. And as we see, there's also other window functions like the last value or lag and lead will give you the previous next value. Um, so a lot of these window functions are really, really helpful. The one that I want to call out is this row number window function, which helps you kind of uh, assign an index to a bunch of rows. It's a very good way to quickly deduplicate large data sets. So instead of doing a distinct over an entire data set, you can kind of uh, give a, a row number to the different rows, partition say by um, a, like an ID, and then you can uh, select out only the rows with the row number one. Uh, so in practice, that's a very, very quick uh, and efficient way to deduplicate large data sets. Just one of the very many use cases for window functions out there. So I'd be doing you a disservice if I didn't tell you that there can be some downsides to writing a lot of SQL. Uh, SQL is certainly a straightforward language. It makes it easy to pick up. Uh, it has a lot of depth to it, but it can lead to scaling, scaling challenges if, uh, if you're not careful. So the bad parts of SQL, well, as a simple language, it doesn't really have any notion of functions for code reuse. And so that might either lead to you doing a lot of typing, which could lead to some typos, uh, some, some sort of syntax errors, things like that. Um, logic errors even. And uh, it might also lead to a lot of copying and pasting where if maybe you're less familiar with SQL or your colleagues are less familiar with SQL, you just kind of grab some code that worked from one place, you copy and paste it over to another place. This presents a real challenge because anytime that you're copying and pasting logic or writing out a lot of sort of individual lines of code, there exists the opportunity for business logic to diverge between different you know, parts of the code base. Um, so this is something that SQL actually makes a little bit challenging to manage, but there is fortunately a really good answer, uh, which is that we can add templating. So what does that look like? Um, here's an example of some code. This is not standard SQL. This is sort of something you would layer on on top of SQL. And in this particular example, we're going to take a page out of playbook from uh, like kind of web development in which you might template out HTML web pages. So what we're looking at here is a language called Jinja, and it's a templating language. And this code that you're looking at would actually run in DBT if, if that's something that you're interested in. So the big idea is that you can enumerate a list of events. So in this case, page view, sign up, and purchase. And then you can loop over those events and generate a valid SQL query. So this is what that generated query might look like. And you can see uh, totally valid. This actually implements the sort of pivot example that we were looking at a little bit earlier. And so if we go back to the source code, you can see it's pretty easy to add a new event to the list on line two, and you don't have to touch any of the other code. It all just kind of works. Um, so really cool. One of the ways to help with scaling SQL is to consider templating your SQL. And if you want to go farther down this path, you can actually use things called macros that are kind of reusable, uh, almost functions that return SQL. And that's a great way to abstract out common logic and prevent the need for you to sort of repeat the same code over and over again. So I would argue that for most uh, problems you might want to solve in data, you could do it in SQL. But just because you can, you know, should you? Well, I'd say yes. Uh, I think you should do it in SQL if you can. One of the big reasons is that SQL is just so dang accessible. 
And by uh, writing code in an accessible way, you can bring more people into the analytics process. So whether you're a data engineer or a data scientist or an analyst, you can all collaborate on code together. Um, it helps kind of bring other people into the process. Um, and as a really big added benefit, non-engineers are empowered to understand this business logic in a way that isn't so true if the code was written in you know, Python or Scala or something like that. Um, turns out because SQL is so accessible, you can get other folks involved in sort of self-serving the answers to their questions, like how is this column defined or where does this data come from? That's a really powerful thing. It sort of removes us as the uh, bottlenecks from the communication process by kind of giving the access to the data or really the, the business logic to all the different stakeholders that we work with. So ultimately more people can contribute in more varied and interesting ways. And that tends to be a really good thing. So casting our minds to the future, uh, what do we think the future holds around SQL? Well, I believe that more data workloads are gonna converge around SQL. Um, I think that we're already seeing that this is the case. Databases are steadily improving their support for more sophisticated SQL operations like AI and ML type uh, tasks, tasks and uh, streaming analytics and, and maybe some other things that we're not so attuned to yet um, that, that I think might be on the horizon. I think as a, as a result of these workloads moving to SQL and improved support from databases, we're going to see that more roles will require SQL knowledge and aptitude uh, for people kind of operating um, at, at their most efficient and their most capable. And ultimately, if we're going to have uh, more work workloads in SQL and uh, more sophisticated SQL operations and more people using SQL, it's also going to necessitate that there are more and better tools to aid in the writing and managing of SQL. I think that's really exciting. I think SQL is a great, a great language and I've seen it uh, sort of transform my own life and career and I've seen it do the same to, to many others. So uh, here's to SQL. And um, at this point, I'm kind of curious what you think. Do you love SQL? Do you hate SQL? You think you want to give another shot? Uh, are there any of your favorite tips or tricks that I might have missed? I'd love to hear about them. Uh, thank you so much for sticking around and learning about SQL with me. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.